Thank you very much for uh, this uh, nice introduction, my proud secret. Um, thank you also to the organizers for uh, inviting me. I appreciate that. Um, you have heard about the complexity on uh, germline mutations using deep sequencing. It's not getting less complex when you move into cancer. So this will be about somatic genetics. Uh, first of all, this is Oslo, part of Oslo, and this is the Radium Hospital, uh, which is now part of Oslo University Hospital, and uh, a center for uh, comprehensive cancer medicine. Let me see. A close-up uh, close of the place. This is the research building, and this translational bridge into the clinic sort of symbolizes our close interaction, which both the two speakers emphasized the importance of, and indeed we think that's extremely important in, in cancer research and cancer treatment. Um, myself, I'm working in this institute and head of the Department of Cancer Prevention, and what I will do is to present uh, two examples of our work, uh, where we have used the high throughput uh, technologies. And uh, <clears throat> the reason I will do that is because, first of all, it will show that even though it's rather convincing data on the research side, there is a long distance before it's of clinical use. So I would like to emphasize that and use that as examples. And then, at the end, I will present this national initiative um, to establish and evaluate genome-based diagnosis for cancer therapy decisions, which has uh, is now being led by Professor Ola Miklebust, and uh, we are organized ourselves. Uh, it's um, all health regions involved, and it has great potential. I have no results I can show you, but I will show you a little bit about the organization and how we think the future may be. So first, a few slides about colorectal cancer. <clears throat> Probably it's uh, familiar to many of you, but anyway. Um, this is one of the four common cancer types. Um, it's, uh, the red indicates the countries where the incidence is highest. This is from IARC update. And as you see, uh, the Western countries have a high incidence of colorectal cancer. It's uh, uh, recorded 1.2 million new cases each year and the survival is about 50% uh, within the first five years after diagnosis. And this varies among even European countries depending on the health system. So in Norway, the uh, figures are about 40% uh, survival across stages, <coughs> but still very high number of deaths. Um, <clears throat> Only lung cancer have a higher number of deaths uh, of cancer diseases. Actually, those four diseases account for 50% of all 200 cancer diseases. So even a small percentage that you can prevent or reduce the mortality is a high number of patients. <clears throat> In Norway, there are 3,600 new cases per year. There is definitely a lack of good non-invasive screening tools which could prevent uh, this disease. There is also <clears throat> a lack of good tumor diagnosis when I'm thinking about stratifying the clinical stages into uh, better subgroups to more um, better uh, handling of the patient groups. <clears throat> I'll come back to that. And also there is a need for improved personalized therapy because in this disease there are very few or close to nothing that are uh, targeted therapy. It's radiation, it's uh, chemotherapy, and it's surgery. <clears throat> this is the four stages, sorry, the four stages of the disease uh, spreading to other organs. Stage four has a very low survival, less than 10% survive five years. Spreading to lymph nodes has uh, between, um, um, has about 60% survival. The localized disease are uh, around uh, 
20 to 30 percent. Even though no lymph node metastases are detected, we know that between 20 and 30 percent will rec uh, have a recurrence. And that is why it would be a very good idea to pick out which ones of these at time of diagnosis should have a more aggressive treatment. And also, if you can have <coughs> find markers that can identify these cancers at early stage, that would uh, help to cure a larger number of patients and thereby reducing the mortality. <coughs> Colorectal cancer has been studied uh, at the genetic level for the last three decades, and there are many well-known molecular phenotypes. The most known are the microsatellite instability, which are about 15%. Typically, you are found on the right-sided tumors, and they have better prognosis than those with many chromosomal aberrations, which are those that are called chromosomal unstable tumors, which account for about 85%. We know from the hereditary syndromes, Helin syndrome, and also those genes of mismatch repair are defect in the somatic uh, tumors. But for the chromosomal instability, there are no one cause, but there are several genes in the cell cycle system that in a small percentage have shown mutations. <coughs> These are phenotypes at the DNA level, and recently we have also described a, a, in analogy a phenotype at the transcriptome le uh, level, which I will not go into now. <coughs> Um, this just summarizes some of the highlights uh, in a timeline of epigenetic and genetic findings uh, that affect or have, have had impact on this disease or the understanding of this disease. And as you can see, it develops uh, through precursor lesions, polyps, adenomas of various uh, sizes, and that is a window of opportunity. If you remove the polyp, you prevent the development of a malignant tumor, at least in that polyp. <clears throat> so despite this quite enormous amount of molecular data in the literature, very few markers are in clinical use, strikingly few. Um, and this is in accordance with both the European and the American uh, recommendations. Uh, for screening, early detection, no molecular markers are recommended, only uh, this test of occult blood in the fecal samples, because tumors also shed samples, uh, cells into the lumen, and you can detect uh, both tumor cells and uh, also blood from the tumor in, in uh, fecal samples. For <coughs> prognostics and prediction, no molecular markers are recommended except the genes that are uh, causing genetic predisposition. And predictive is used both, uh, is used in two ways in the genetics. They use it for, to predict that you get the disease, but the oncologists use, this, use it as to predict how you respond to the uh, drug you receive. So. That's uh, sort of uh, important to keep in mind. And for the predictive markers with regard to response to therapy, there is only one that is recommended. If you use anti-EGFR antibody, you should have the key RAS uh, mutation status. This is now recommended from the European um, group. <coughs> Although in the literature there are also debated whether this is um, really true. For monitoring, following the patients, it's still only uh, CEA that is recommended. <coughs> so we have uh, taken part in searching for biomarkers that can be of any use uh, for the various um, um, uh, challenges for this disease. And a biomarker is, um, per definition, 
any type of uh, marker that uh, you are that you can find in blood or in uh, bodily fluids or in tissues that give you any information about the disease or, for instance, the response to certain therapy. And <clears throat> I will give you two examples of the results, which is uh, a biomarker set for early detection and one for improved prognostics of stage two and stage three uh, colorectal cancers. So for um, a biomarker for early detection, um, there are a few important points that to, to obtain an optimal, optimal marker. It should have a high sensitivity. It should be present when you have a, a tumor and it should not be present in normal controls. So it should have a high specificity. It should also be a test that would be easy to perform. So it should be um, possible to move it into the routine and it should be a non-invasive test. <coughs> Today, the golden standard for early detection is colonoscopy. And the compliance for that is low and the costs are very high. Uh, so what we did and also others was to <coughs> actually not go for gene mutations uh, because for some genes you may have hotspots for mutations but for others you have to actually look through the whole gene and that may indicate a number of PCRs and tests for a routine screen. And, but for methylation in the promoter region is... Uh, a, a characteristic of tumor cells for individual genes and they typically also occur early in the tumor development and many of them have a much higher percentage of methylation than you find for genes with mutation. So that is <coughs> um, features that makes this uh, a good idea to actually search for these types of uh, inactivated genes. <coughs> And we did uh, this. Um, we used uh, an epigenome uh, screen to start with, and <coughs> we used a combination of in vitro models and the patient samples. And uh, there has been a lot of uh, various analysis throughout about five years since we started. A lot of biological, technical, and clinical validation analysis. Um, which I cannot go in, into here, but we did <coughs> identify six biomarkers. I can see it's not sort of in the middle of the screen, but uh, hopefully you haven't lost too much. Um, <coughs> the, the first marker we validated was published in 2007 and the panel in 2011. And obviously if this was... Um, good panel and a novel panel, it would have a uh, commercial value. So we, we filed a patent in 2007 and it has taken the first, this, is, this was the first time we did this, so it has taken five years. But we have obtained now this year, <coughs> the hospital signed a license agreement with Oxford Gene Technology, who will develop these markers into a commercial test. So that means that I at least uh, believe uh, quite thoroughly in, uh, in the results we have sh uh, shown. Um, but still, <coughs> we would not know if they get it onto the market within a reasonable time, and we will not know how it will perform in a screening project and whether it will be recommended for a population screen. So even though as a researcher you are done sort of your work, it's uh, many, still many challenges before it can be of uh, benefit. <coughs> These are the six markers, which each one of them has a high sensitivity, both in adenomas and carcinomas, as you can see. But the panel as such are even better. And we go for the panel because that gives the test a robustness, both a biological and a technical robustness. Um, <coughs> just um, interesting is that uh, biomarkers doesn't necessarily have to have a function as long as they are a good biomarker for something. But in this case, and 
quite often actually there are um, uh, genes that are known from rare diseases. And we have two here. This is uh, SPG20, which is when mutated, causing Troyer's syndrome. And this is typical of cancers. And indeed, um, we have several gene lists and not always can we follow them, but this gene we followed and we have identified, it's known to have a function in degradation and trafficking of EGFR, but we have also shown that it has a new function in cancer and that is it is involved in cytokinesis. <coughs> um, Lin is the one who has been uh, uh, the key investigator for this epigenetic study. And she has also compared our panel uh, with the two markers that are on the market, Colosur and Epiprocolon, which are two individual markers with suboptimal sensitivity and specificity, both of them. And our panel outperforms those uh, markers, uh, in, at least in our hands. <coughs> okay. So, still, early detection for colon tumors are colonoscopy. And there are large screening studies going on, but there is a definite need for improved non-invasive uh, tests. <laughs> so I will move uh, now on to <clears throat> when, even though you can uh, prevent uh, a certain number of cases, you will always have a lot of cases that get cancer. So now what do we do when you get diagnosed with colorectal cancer. Today, they are only divided into four clinical stages, which is very crude. So we set out to see if we could identify prognostic markers for colorectal cancer that would improve, uh, improve the prognostication. And we have a very close collaboration with the clinic uh, and with the researchers in, in the surgical um, uh, department. And um, <coughs> this is also, uh, to stress once more the importance of this close interaction, both on the discussion side, but also to get the high quality uh, material and the high quality clinical data. It is, doesn't help to have advanced technology. If you have shit in, it's shit out, and that's literally in this disease, but uh, <laughs> it is, it will be like that. So we are lucky that we are actually in this large hospital where this is possible. For this, we have used uh, exon-level microarrays <coughs> from Affymetrix. In contrast to the, the more classical microarrays, we typically have probes in the tree prime end. The exon level have uh, several probes per exon per gene. On average, uh, 40 probes per gene. <coughs> And if you use all these probes to get an average gene expression value for the individual gene, you have most likely a more robust gene expression value than if you use these microarrays. So what we did was to analyze, um, actually a little bit more than this, but uh, between three and 400 stage two and stage three colorectal cancers, that's the middle stages. Um, <coughs> <clears throat> and the two persons who did this are these two postdocs. And what they used was a, a special uh, statistical uh, modeling um, method <coughs> with this long name. It's a multivariate uh, analysis. Um, but what I will point out that this type of statistics had not previously been done on the expression studies for colorectal cancer. And we think this was, um, in a way, a clever way to do it, because it picks out, of course, genes that are associated with survival, but not necessarily those with the strongest association, but those that together combined given the best uh, prognosis. And they also pick out genes which have high variance, so that the gene expression levels varies a lot, which is important when you're going to 
a more easy test, that it's not everything is similar. <laughs> you can actually distinguish the expression. And also, it, uh, it uh, makes sure that the, the number of, um, of genes will not be too high, so it's a limited number, and the correlation between them is low. So they actually contribute each and one of them into the prognostic signature. That's sort of the, the simple explanation for this method. A series, but also in a series from the States and Australia. So it's across populations and also across platforms because they had used a different uh, microarray platform. This shows that the signature is robust. We have also shown that it's independent of adjuvant chemotherapy. That's important because stage three patients get adjuvant chemotherapy at the age below 75 years as a routine. For those we had information that, that had not gotten this, we could also separate the curves. So it's not dependent on the, on the chemotherapy. And furthermore, which is also very interesting, I think, is that the elderly patients, those above 75 years, we could also, although a very small group, we could definitely select those with per prognosis. And this uh, result is the only re uh, result of this kind from signatures on stage three, which now ha it has been shown that for the traditional standard chemotherapy given to people above 75, they have as much um, benefit from it as those younger. The reason they have this artificial cutoff is because they think the, uh, they will be weaker and the mobility will be higher and they will not tolerate it as good, but that's not true. The, this was now recently shown in uh, JCO in a study with several thousand patients. So this opens actually for a possibility to select among them by doing such a screen ahead and see you have really a poor signature and should perhaps receive this aggressive treatment. <clears throat> so that is um, the last slide on this. Um, we have shown that we have, are able to divide stage two into good and poor prognosis. If we can confirm this uh, by transferring, transferring the signature into a new technology, we have already done that to Tackman assays, it works perfectly. And we are now going to validate it in a prospective series. If it still keeps, then <clears throat> we are in discussion with the oncologists to actually offer this to the stage two patients that come to the hospital. Because that ethical okay. <laughs> If you know we are in a poor prognostic group, you're just asked to get standard chemotherapy. You're moved into another class, so to say. And also, as I told you about these elderly patients in, in this stage three uh, level. So this um, moves me into uh, this national project because obviously we would like to sequence the uh, colorectal cancer um, patients, um, having certain hypotheses, but also a consecutive series. And by having these type of stratifications in the background, there may, might be very interesting findings of mutations uh, through exome sequencing. For instance, if you can detect actionable genes where you have known drugs for, that can hypothesize setting up combined therapy, for instance. So <clears throat> by this, I'll just move into the, this national uh, effort um, where we really do not have results to show you, but I will give you some history and show you where we are. Uh, in fact, cancer is a national priority area uh, of, of Norway. <clears throat> and in 2011, the um, health region set down a, a group that should come with a suggestion of what should we do. And we suggested this, individualized cancer treatment for all Norwegian patients based on the gene profile of their own tumor. This, we were, <clears throat> at the time, 
look to England, where the stratified cancer medicine program were initiated. But in contrast to them, we, when we go for one technology, deep sequencing, in England they have many types of methods that are going into the same type of project. Um, so that's the main difference. We also have the possibility to actually include or at least be population relevant, no selection in, in patients, which is also a difference. Uh, this uh, suggestion was given a priority by the National Collaboration Group for Health and Medical Research. And due to that, um, we were able to get funding for a large project that has been uh, organized by Professor Ola Miklubust, uh, who could not be here today. Uh, and <coughs> he and uh, colleagues at the Radium Hospital had initiated a project locally. Um, we had also done something similar on our own project. And Oslo Cancer Cluster, uh, which is a Norwegian cluster of expertise, had also <coughs> done that. But he was able to sort of uh, gather us all, <laughs> which is not easy in Norway. It's, uh, we are only five million people, but we are spread out. So we are now in the project. All universities from all the health regions are part of this. And also the Norwegian Biotechnology Advisory Board and the Ethics Group at the University of Oslo are part of it. And also the uh, also Cancer Cluster, I'll come back to that a little bit very soon. <coughs> So what is special about the Norwegian approach? Um, <clears throat> we, we will s sequence this exome of both the normal and the tumor of each patient. We have, that's the difference between the hereditary disease and the cancer. You have to have the normal to sort of extract away all the normal variations. Um, and of the other initiatives in Europe, uh, they do not full exome sequencing of all. It's often selected. Um, for instance, the kinome or selected actionable genes. Um, we have a tremendous good Norwegian cancer registry, which will incorporate a somatic mutation database. And <clears throat> there are dedicated research groups and clinicians working with the eight first cancer types included and we will sequence 2,000 samples, uh, about uh, 1,000 patients. And the, those are selected according to the design of the studies. And we have included also two clinical trial units at the east and the west of Norway. This is the setup. <coughs> the four university hospitals will provide the samples that go into the <coughs> to the sequencing uh, uh, technology platforms, and it will be stored in a national mutation database. Secure storage, there is a lot of work going on on that side. Um, these are the eight uh, diseases that are so far included. <coughs> Part of the mutation data will be sent to the cancer registry which are used to receiving this type of data. And the clinical data will also go to the cancer registry and they will accumulate national somatic mutation data together with clinical data. So that gives us a really great potential for future uh, population-based work. I'm a little bit out of to date or? No, no, you have two, two more minutes. Okay. Um, so what is the added value from this uh, collaboration? Uh, first of all, it's a value is that it's population-based. We are a small country and we have a very good health system, so it's possible actually to do it. It is possible to set up standardized analysis in all the cities that are included. That's important, the logistics, it's possible and it's equal patient access throughout uh, the country. That is our health systems that make that possible. And it's also possible to do the treatment uh, choices standardized, also for new therapies. 
and we will have a national follow-up of multiple number equal one trials. There will be individual patients that will, in this close interaction, be, be treated with new drugs, and this information will be accumulated in the national registry. <coughs> and then when the amount of data or mutations uh, are ready, uh, various uh, analysis can be done, including the economic uh, consequences. And also over time, accumulation of outcome data can be included in such analysis. Just to the end here, I would like to emphasize uh, Oslo Cancer Cluster and the importance of having such a center of expertise in the, in the vicinity. They are most likely going to build the Oslo Cancer Cluster Innovation Park close to the Radium Hospital. And what these uh, people do is actually to get the interaction and the cooperation between the academic people and the R&D parts of uh, uh, big pharma and small biotech companies. Um, and that should not be underestimated because it's two very different cultures and we really think uh, very good together. And I think that will also increase throughout the years. And at, as it is now, it's not like in the England where actually Pfizer is one of the major supporters financially. We do not have, we only have public funding, but they may uh, support, for instance, clinical studies along the way. <coughs> So the short-term goal is the sequencing of these thousand patients, carefully selected, um, selected according to clinical design, some larger series among the common cancers, longitudinal studies of a few patients, following them over time, and also this number equal one trials accumulation. <coughs> the big challenge is this is a major research uh, project. So the big challenge is how to implement it into the clinic. That will go over time, but the, to actually be in a comprehensive cancer center makes it possible to do it stepwise. But we need much closer interaction with the health authorities to get them to really agree on this as a very good uh, uh, project and to realize that we need to have competence in our own country to build up that if the clinicians is going to take it into use. That I think is a very important point. And in our opinion, uh, once we have proven that certain findings are important for testing, we would like to transfer this into molecular pathology because this is somatic genetics and the molecular pathology should do this and run, for instance, the MySEC sequences on selected genes, not the medical genetics units. <coughs> so we foresee or most likely that cancers may be increasingly classified by driving molecular events rather than by organ site. Thank you very much, Ragnar, for an interesting talk. Uh, I just wonder one thing, how, what do you do with incidental findings that has nothing to do with cancer if you find them, let's say? Mm. Yes, um, that is of course an important ethical question. And as far as I understand now, we have uh, close collaboration with the eth uh, regional ethical committees and also with the medical uh, geneticists and we agree on that we are actually looking for somatic changes and they will not get any information about what m should be, could be present in the germline. We are just using it as control. They will be treated as cancer patients okay. also with regard to the information. That uh, is at least how it is now. Thanks. Mm. Well, um, thank you very, very much again. I think there is a gift for you as well.